So let's see. Um, we right. I think the thing to talk about is uh, instantons and. Um, Yeah, I think that's the next topic. So we're going to do instantons and then um, anions and then churn simons. I don't know how much of that we'll get through today, but we'll make a uh, pass at it. Um, by the way, where did you hear the the uh, the Higgs thing from? Well, I heard from someone in the office. But the, I guess originally it was. Oh, well, that's right. I told Daniel. I heard from someone in my office. Oh, okay. Who? Uh, well, even Jonas had heard about it actually over the, over the weekend, I think. Uh, but it was on, I guess at first, Peter Voigt's blog. Peter? Yeah. He's a physicist at, I don't know, somewhere. But uh, this. You know what? I forgot my coffee. Just give me a second. Okay.
gauge fields that um, kind of minimize the Euclidean action. Okay? If they minimize the Euclidean action, then the damping is less. That's the idea of an instant bond. Now, of course, you can really minimize the uh, Euclidean action by just setting the gauge field equal to zero. What, what is the idea of an instant bond? It's minimizing the, isn't something always trying to, no, 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 no. In, in, in a pattern where you integrate a wall field. Sure. I mean, it says the lower action ones contribute more to the pattern, right? So why are these? The lower the, the, lower the action, the more the contribution. Uh -huh. so, so where does where do instant times come into that? I mean, are we identifying? Well, we're, 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 there, there are two issues here. There are two issues. Obviously, I can open that for you. <laughs> so are, are instantons uh, some sort of a solution to uh, field theory? Oh, Jesus, sorry. Uh, uh, lawsuit. Just kidding. Come on, that's good chocolate. Don't talk lawsuit. <laughs> um, care about that. Okay, let, 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 let me. Oh, I'm sorry, what was your question? It, are instantons a solution, a particular solution? To yes, 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 I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, let me just try to go here at a normal pace, all right? Obviously, A equals zero minimizes the Euclidean action. Moreover, so another question is, you're integrating over another field here. Gauge we field, well, yeah. You only have one field in the action. All right, get in. Okay, okay, okay. All right. <laughs> Sidebar, D slash, sign. There. Um, now, what, what you can do is you can, of course, you have A equals zero, minimize the action. You can also have, instead of A equals zero, it's essentially zero, and then a tiny bump, and then it's zero again. And, um, so how do we know that that also minimizes the action? Because it's close, well, because because it's close to A to zero? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, but the instanton is somewhat different. The instanton is um, that you're, you're asking that the variation of the Euclidean action about the instanton field configuration uh, should uh, leave the action invariant. And so obviously what you get from that is the Euclidean field equations. And so the instanton is the solution of the Euclidean field equations. Now you can ask, why should a solution that's a, why, why should an instanton that is, um, that makes the Euclidean action stationary be more important than just some pimple on A equals zero? And I have no answer for that. And in fact, um, I think that's a good question. And I think it may be that people who went off in the instanton direction, it was a craze uh, back in the late 70s. Um, it may have been misguided. But in any event, there's, there's some amusing mathematical physics here. Um, You, you see the stationarity, if, if you're talking about the Minkowski path integral, then stationarity really is important because these, when it's stationary, all these paths add up. Whereas if you have the Euclidean action, stationarity doesn't really cut any ice. Okay. So I've, I've, I've given you all the caveats, now let's go to the party line. The party line says, well, let's have f a mu nu go to zero as x goes to infinity, including infinity, uh, under a gauge transformation, a goes to a prime, which is u a u adjoint plus u exterior derivative u adjoint. And uh, what's a pure gauge? Well, if 
in as much as we want f to go to zero as x goes to infinity, what we need is that a goes to just a pure gauge, which is u exterior derivative u adjoint as uh, you go to spatial infinity. Feel free to ask questions, especially if you want a piece of chocolate. You can probably think of something relevant. I think one is enough for a whole class. It's very rich. Yeah, well, I, I thought that instead of buying a huge bag of the stuff that I have been handing out, I spent the same amount on a smaller bag of better chocolate. So that's what All right, well, let's look at such a U. X4 plus I X dot sigma. Okay. So this is a, uh, an, uh, this is a, an element of the gauge group. This is, I'm going to show you in a moment, that this is in SU2. Sigma are the Pauli matrices. Why is it in SU2? First of all, it's unitary. U U dag it is X4 minus I X dot sigma because the Pauli matrices are Hermitians. And because the cross term cancels and we and uh, we just get x four squared plus x vector squared. And um, so we want this to be one. So I this is not always unitary, it's unitary if x mu squared is equal to one. And we're the metric is Euclidean for all plus signs. Um, box for that breaking. Um, moreover, uh, we want the determinant of u to be zero. Well, I'm not to be zero, to be one. one. And in fact, the determinant of this matrix is one, again, if this is true. And you can, you can work it out with your fingers if you want. If you want, I'll do it explicitly in class. Anybody want to see it? All right, so what, what, what we can see then is, what, what, is this, what does this thing tell us? This is the unit sphere. And in fact, it's the sphere S3. Whereas S2 is the sphere that we walk on. This is the sphere I walk on. What? I say we walk on B3. This is the sphere that I walk on. You walk on S3. <laughs> Good for you. All right. Um, now, remember that we learned the trace of f squared, um, which of course is trace of dA plus a squared squared. Last week, I assigned as a homework problem that this could be written as the exterior derivative of a dA plus two-thirds a cubed, where, of course, a is a mu, the x mu, and a there is a, normally we take it to be a Hermitian matrix. This is an anti-Hermitian matrix because we've tossed it an extra i and make things nicer. The idea there is that the covariant derivative then is derivative plus a. Well, except um, here I'm thinking of this as just a, the anti-emission matrix. I suppose the point is that if we write this as a form, then D is equal to D plus A. Okay. Um, now, if that's what the trace of F squared is, then the Euclidean action is minus 1 over 4 g squared, integral d fourth x, trace of f squared, which is minus 1 over 4 g squared, d fourth x, d trace a dA plus 2 thirds a cubed. By the way, a dA turns out to be the churn simons term in 2 plus 1 dimensions. Let's 
So you said A mu was a matrix? Yeah. So A mu, each, so A0 takes, is an element of SU2, right? Plus or minus I, A mu, A, T A, yeah. T X mu, and the algebra. Right. Okay. And those are, those are generated, they're not elements, the elements of the Lie algebra, not the elements yeah. of the group. Okay. Okay, but now R A is U D U dagger. And what is D A? Well, of course, D A is F minus A squared, just because we've in the form language, F is dA plus A squared. So this thing here, <laughs> this Euclidean action, is minus 1 over 4 g squared uh, times an integral d fourth x d on trace of A, and now I'm replacing dA by F minus A squared. One of those counterintuitive things that's often so useful in uh, mathematics. You step, you go forward by taking a step backwards. Um, so this is minus one over four g squared integral d four of x. Again, exterior derivative trace, and now what we have is a f and um, minus a cubed plus two thirds, so it's minus a third a cubed. Okay. Now, um, now this integral here was over all of four space, but remember the very cute uh, identity, namely this is also one over four g squared. Let me call all space s. No, what am I going to call it? Can't call it u because we've got u. M. W for world. So now this is d. So we go, this is now over the boundary of the world trace AF minus a third A cubed. And notice since we're now in a totally formal language, um, in fact, this was already completely formal, so this d fourth x was superfluous. In other words, all the, they, they, you get the dx's from, you get one dx from here, another dx from there, and two dx's from here. So you've got d4 of x built in. Okay. In fact, I'll even. So when you write it in coordinate form, you're saying you get the dx. Yeah. Okay. So the integral of the world of the exterior derivative of whatever is the integral of the boundary of the world whatever. Okay, but now we're integrating over the boundary of the world, which of course is effectively the sphere S3 at infinity. Right. You're the human sphere and you go configuration. And so as we go out to the boundary of the world, f goes to zero. And so this Euclidean action is now 1 over 12 g squared integral over this inflated sphere of the trace of a cubed. But a, in fact, is just u d u dagger. So this is 1 over 12 g squared integral s3 
of the trace of human the you dagger cube. This last quantity is quantum Nagin's index. This is, in other words, we're mapping from S3 to S3, because U is this, is, lives on S3, a different S3. U mm -hmm. is this guy over here. So we have a map of S3 to S3, and in fact, this map from S3 to S3 is just pi 3 of S3, which is the integer Z. And the index, this Pontryagin's index is the integer that the map corresponds to. Uh, Any other so questions? I, I have more chocolate. So you're saying we do this integral, we're going to get a number, and that number is the index? It's an integer, and it's an index, yes. Uh, and, and so, sorry, well, what's, again, the meaning of that index? How do we think about it? What does it mean? It's the number of times, in other words, you, you, you're integrating over the surface of the sphere at infinity. Mm -hmm. As you go around that surface of the sphere, as you integrate over the surface of the sphere, you're going over the surface of the sphere of S, the, the S3 of um, SU2, the, which is the SU2 group manifold. The, the index is how many times can you go over the SU2 group manifold when you go over the sphere once. It's the analog of what's much easier to think about, namely the map of S1 to S1 of e to the i n theta. Here, the an analog, an, Analog of quantum Huygens index is n, and so it's just the number of times that you wrap around the circle when you go once around this circle. <coughs> when you go around theta zero and zero to pi, you go around the circle n times. It's a higher dimensional analog of a winding number kind of thing. It is. It yeah. is a winding number. I yeah. think they use the same term. Um, Okay, so there's all this cute mathematics, it's why people yeah. like this so much. But as I said, I don't know, maybe I'm missing, I'm obviously. So this, you said that, that you're, you were complaining about the, it being the Euclidean action, but is there not a kind of alternative formulation? Kind of a, it's your, it, is the problem in, in that it's in the Euclidean action? Or, or whatever you're saying, <laughs> you can no, no, chalk. But well, say it again, because no, no, I, I haven't understood what you said. Well, maybe I'm wrong. And you, you, the thing you were, I don't know, most upset about was that they for, it's formulated in the Euclidean action. No, no, no. It's perfectly fine. That all Euclidean action makes a great deal of sense. And remember what the Euclidean action is. It basically gives you a projection operator on the physical vacuum. So there's an enormous amount of, of uh, physical uh, significance to that because precisely in QCD, you don't know what the physical vacuum is. In fact, I once knew a uh, French physicist who, um, the, the word for vacuum is vide. And um, the, 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 in the subway, the metro in Paris and I guess in other French cities, the tracks where the train goes is called Le Vide. And somebody here has a visitor. What's that? Is he waiting? Yeah. Anyway, so my friend Jan Stan would say, attention au vide. <laughs> speaking of the physical vacuum. I'm just pointing at the, at the subway. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's what it is. Um,
this is is the appropriate one. This Pontryagin index is the appropriate one for the non-abelian theory. Um, clearly, there's something much simpler for the abelian theory, which gives you just this number n, um, and it's it. I guess it's just the integral d theta of d theta e to the minus i n theta e to the i n theta. Yeah. Well, this is the analog of Quantryakin's index for the other case. And um, well, one over two pi. Okay. So what you have then for a an instanton is should this is n. Should that be one over two pi i? Actually, hmm? should that be one over two pi i? No, no, no. The i is can, minus i cancels out. But when you take that derivative, and i comes out. No, you're right. Duh. One. Uh, it's i times i over two pi. Okay. All right. You're going to chocolate. All right, notice, all right, so I'm going to come back to what I said before. Remember when I said before that I, I'm i not sure that this all this excitement over the instantons makes any sense? Notice the value here of this action. It's n, an integer, over 12 g squared. Mm -hmm. So you can also take a a gauge configuration which is zero everywhere and then just departs from zero and some, you know, makes some pimple in gauge space. Well, that would have a lower action. It would contribute more significantly to the Euclidean action. You know, so the these instantons they're very cute, but I I'm I'm afraid I think that they're overrated and moreover the strong CP problem. So, I mean, well, the strong CP problem, let me just finish the sentence. Mm -hmm. The strong CP problem is based on an instanton type analysis, and um, it may not be all that significant. Yeah, you were saying. Uh, so, you say they're overrated, but what, so what is their intended purpose? What they're people wanted to do was approximate the uh, path integral for QCD by summing over instanton configurations. And I think the fundamental error was they thought that because the instanton made the thing stationary and was a local minimum of the Euclidean action. And thus would contribute more. Right. Yeah. But although they're a local minimum, and because they satisfy zero is variation of, they keep the action stationary, um, their value is n over 12 g squared. And you know, you can get obviously get smaller than that by having these pimple configurations. So I don't know, I don't see I don't I don't see the point. It's very cute, but I don't see the point. Okay, now let's switch to something um, that is really amusing, namely will check on axion. No, on not axion, anion. So this is this is a completely different, okay? a complete change of of brain cells. Right? Actually, before I do that, let me say something about angular momentum, um, which um, should show us why we should be ready for surprises when it comes to angular momentum. Um, let me quote. Weinberg 7.4.23. What is the angular momentum? Well, Jij is it's the generator of rotations. So it's the partial of Lagrange density with respect to psi dot L. And of course by psi, Weinberg just means field labeled L. Isn't necessarily a fermion field. In fact, I'm going to talk about a gauge field. Oh, you mean it's the L species of field? Yeah, versus yeah, being yeah. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. A vector field? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and J is spatial. We're talking angular momentum here. Okay, so then this means that 
any and all sizes that appear here are all scalar fields? No, 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 all fields. Okay. So there could be another index there. That's Okay, so this is the actual angular momentum. Uh, it's what you get when you apply Noether's theorem to the notion that the action doesn't depend upon, uh, doesn't change when you do a rotation. What is this, uh, what is this J here? Well, in fact, here's the change in psi L. It's I over 2 omega mu nu J mu nu Lm psi M. So this is for the more general case of a Lorentz transformation, but of course the rotations are part of the R Lorentz transformations. They're just ones that don't involve time. Rotations are there are six generators of the Lorentz group, three of them the rotations. So this J I J that we're talking about here is the case for uh, I and J, uh, mu nu being going from one to three. And for a covariant vector field, uh, J rho sigma kappa lambda minus i eta rho kappa delta sigma lambda plus i eta sigma kappa delta rho lambda. Anyway, but we're really talking space space, so the distinction between upper and lower indices can be abandoned and it's uh, eta is just the identity. So this is simpler than it looks. But I'm not I'm not Focusing on that. Now, let's, I'm, I want to now look at a gauge theory. So let's take psi L to be A alpha I. In other words, the i spatial component and the alpha uh, color. And what is partial L, partial D0, a alpha i. Well, this is a Weinberg equation also. 15.4.5 plus 15 means it's in volume 2. And uh, what was this one? 7 means it's volume 1. This is, in fact, minus the Maxwell field strength of 0 i alpha, which is d0 a alpha i minus t i a alpha zero plus and Weinberg uses the structure uses capital C for some reason for the structure so that's what it is now the point that the reason for my doing this is is just to say that um, when you rewrite this you see that Jij is an integral d cubed x minus f zero l alpha minus x i j a alpha l plus x j d i a alpha l minus i and the j i j. This is just a matrix. L m a alpha. The point is, this thing already has quadratic, quadratic term, it's quadratic in the gauge fields, so the angular momentum is cubic in, in the gauge fields. Okay. And um, it seems to me that this may have something to do with these funny uh, Spin, spin of the proton conundrum, which uh, 
people have been talking about and Rick. Which cult, which kind of is Frankly, I haven't followed it very carefully, but um, every now and then there's a seminar or a colloquium saying that the spin of the proton doesn't add up. And I, I think that it, if it doesn't add up, it's because they're ignoring this cubic term in gauge fields. Gluon fields. Right. Okay, so that's a deep reason to expect that um, when you study angular momentum seriously, you might find a surprise here and there. Um, another reason is simply that L is just simply, in the very simplest terms, when you take R cross P, P here is the mechanical momentum, mechmom, and that is R cross Uh, grad over I minus QA when you go to quantum mechanics. Okay. So it's not just grad, it's, it brings in the gauge field. So the gauge field even comes in, at, in, in elementary quantum mechanics. Okay, now to Wilczek's paper. Uh, this was his 1982 paper. Let's, let's think about a solenoid here. It's an infinite solenoid, but I'm not very tall, so I can't draw it. Um, <laughs> so we have um, current going through this, and as a result, we have some B field like that. Okay, that's our solenoid, and the B field is quite small on the side. Do you have a question? The chalk is very good. All right, so uh, initially we imagine that the current is zero, the B field is zero, and we've got some particle of charge Q that's going around like this. And the angular momentum operator is LZ, which is minus I dV, and it's, uh, its eigenvalues Integral eigenvalues. Okay. Normal orbital, it's orbital angular momentum. Orbital. All right. Now, what we do is we turn on the solenoid slowly, if you care. I don't know why, but anyway, let's suppose it's slowly. What happens? Well, Faraday's law tells us that the curl of E is minus B dot. And in fact, um, that's part of, of, of the equation that is just, isn't that just is that, what is that? DF equals zero. And it's DF equals zero because that's DBA. Because F is, in the Abelian theory, F is just DA. So, in fact, this gives you four equations, three of them are here. The other one is that the divergence of B is zero. All right, what's the electric field that you get from this? The electric field at R is minus Z hat cross R over 2 pi x squared plus y squared times phi dot. Okay, so what is the change in the angular momentum? Well, the change in the angular momentum, L dot, is going to be R cross P dot. R dot cross P being zero. Actually, I'm just wondering about that. Because normally you say R dot cross P is zero because P is proportional to V. And V is R dot. Hmm? And V is R dot. And V is R dot, yes. But here, I just got through saying that P involves A. So R. Right. So um, let me assign that as an extra credit problem. 
is this really true when P is uh, grad over I minus uh, E okay. The mechanical momentum is in the, the fiat direction, right? And I believe that the... Yes. I believe that the gauge potential is also in the fiat direction. Yeah, I, 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 I think you've just gotten your extra credit point, so you should send me an email or something to remind me my assignment grades. I have to help you up to the P plus 12 um, if you're not there already, but I think you're already there. Anyway, yeah, I think you're right. Um, these are all essentially in the phi direction, and uh, R dot is in the phi direction, so R dot cross A would, would vanish. All right, so that's another bullet dodged. Okay, well, what is uh, this? Then this would be R cross QE, because P dot is, of course, QE, and we're looking at how this changes in the Z direction. So that's L dot Z. And so this then is minus Q over 2 pi, R vector cross Z hat cross R vector, all that Z component divided by X squared plus Y squared. So that's Z cross R, I mean R cross Z cross R, effectively. And if you think about it, You've got the z-axis here, you've got this r vector here, this angle theta. This turns out to be minus q over 2 pi r squared sine squared theta phi dot over x squared plus y squared. And of course, this cancels that. And so altogether, lz dot is equal to minus q over 2 pi phi dot. And so this is interesting. This means the change in LZ just depends upon the final flux. And that means then that the angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum, mind you, is some integer, what we started with, minus q phi over 2 pi. By the way, in one of um, Wilczek's recent papers, uh, he mentions that, in fact, this was discovered not first by him in 82, but by um, two people who were obscure and still are. <laughs> in the late 70s. So about five years, 77, I think. Um, they, uh, they discovered it and published it, and people thought that it was um, a mistake or irrelevant or something that they, you know, they'd have to hire somebody to sweep it under the rug. This change is due to a complete loop around that? It's, it's how many times the charged particle goes around depends upon its momentum. Mm -hmm. It's that as you, you start out with the field being zero, you turn on the electricity, the field gradually builds up to a final flux phi, and then um, when you have that flux phi, you keep turning, you keep the current going to keep the magnetic field constant, but you don't increase it anymore. So you increase the magnetic field from zero to B, and the flux goes from zero to phi, and the angular momentum then goes from integer to integer minus Q, the charge of the particle, phi over two pi. I see. So there's nothing to do with how many times it wraps no. around. Yeah, it's just no. this is what the yes. mechanical angular momentum is. Yes, you earned another piece of chalk. Do you want it? No. Right. Was it too thick? Too I'm thick. good. You're all right. Would the greater like to ask? No, thanks. I would pass. What? It's a pretty good job. All right. OK, so that's um, Wilczek's first, uh, first
first uh, pass at this, which he called A. Um, and because he knew that, and, uh, that people were going to have a hard time swallowing this argument, he rewrote the argument in a, uh, uh, in a different way. So now he says, let's suppose M MV is P minus QA, which is what we've been assuming all along. Um, and of course, LZ is minus I, D phi minus Q, A phi. And what is A phi? Well, A phi is, in fact, flux over to pi. That's, uh, that's what A phi is. And, and, and we can see that by just saying the phi is equal to the integral b dot ds, which is the integral of the curl of a dot ds dot ds, which is the integral of a dot dx, which is then 2 pi a phi. By the way, in formal language, this is integral f over m is integral dA over m is integral a of the boundary of m. So that's what this looks like. In formal language, that's what it is. All right, now let's suppose our wave function psi n is e to the i n phi times Then um, what is LZ on psi n? Well, it's minus I d phi minus Q a phi on uh, psi n. And this, whoops, is equal sign. Equals um, minus I d phi minus Q phi over 2 pi psi n. And minus i d phi, well, that's just n. So this is n minus q phi over 2 pi psi n. So in other words, the state of angular momentum n, orbital angular momentum n, in fact, has orbital angular momentum z direction of n minus q phi over 2 pi. So these two viewpoints lead to the same um, conclusion. In the one case, we physically turn on the solenoid. In the other case, we just say, well, there's the gauge field. Um, this is the angular momentum. Bingo. <coughs> now, he, um, not satisfied with that, he did a third way of doing it. And um, the third way is, is more tricky because he uses a singular gauge transformation. So he wants a prime, which is a minus grad lambda, to vanish. So um, let lambda, lambda be phi, phi over 2 pi. And so. Is it all points? Yeah. Well, yeah, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Notice this is singular because this thing is multi-valued or equivalently discontinuous. As phi goes from 0 to 2 pi, we're fine. But when it goes to 2 pi plus epsilon, all of a sudden it falls off a, a 2 pi cliff. Okay? So this is a discontinuous. AK, I mean, it's multi-valued is a perhaps a more accurate, it is a more accurate term than discontinuous because it is discontinuous, but a discontinuous function could be something like a cone. So phi is running from 0 to 2 pi, is that what you're saying? Well, yeah. Okay. So how is this multi-valued? 
Well, at phi equals zero, on one side it's zero, on the other side it's big phi. In other words, if we time gives us the axis, coming out as so it doesn't mean the x axis, it keeps going around. If you just a little bit to the left, your phi, but just to the right, zero. You go the a, lambda goes from zero to big phi. So it's not just zero to two pi, it's zero to whatever. Well, there's phi. Yeah. Of course, it's only going to happily have capital phi and lower phi, which is it's not the smartest pedagogy, but I guess flux always is phi anyway, almost. You know, you use. All right. So All right, draw what? that's If you draw it in this suggested way, then I see how that works, but uh, so phi is like an angular variable, obviously. Phi is an angle. Yeah, so. And we had a, a Can't I, we, we had a kosher, we had a kosher lambda, capital lambda, phi lambda of two pi and lambda of zero would be the same. You always want that. So this is singular. All right. Well, we've got time. There's no, there's no rush, so we we don't have to get to the next time. Okay, let's side prime be e to the minus i q lambda psi. So this is our gauge transformation. Then psi prime at p plus two pi is e to the minus i lambda of p plus two pi. Lambda, phi plus two pi, sorry. No, this is a phi, not a lambda. Over 2 pi, and there's a q. Minus i q lambda, lambda is phi, phi, phi lambda. So that's this phi plus 2 pi because it's phi plus 2 pi. Psi of phi. Now, um, 2 pi, okay, let me do this. What I got was, in my notes, let me just do it here, because this is not, well, this, this, must, this must be a typo. That's over 2 pi, psi prime of phi. Okay, let's just verify that this is the case. This is e to the minus i q phi over 2 pi, psi prime of phi is e to the minus i q lambda of phi, which is minus i q phi phi over 2 pi. Plus I n phi Well, we got the I n phi so that's going to be relevant. Somehow I I worked this out in the notes, but somehow I'm getting it wrong here. What is the what is this psi? So you have psi prime equals e to the minus i. Right, we're making a gauge tra we're making a gauge transformation to blow away the gauge field. And so uh, psi is all psi prime is the old psi so every point in the gauge field transform. Is getting this transformation. Every point in the field? Or yeah, in the gauge transformation, every point in space you change the the fields by you know, by a certain in a certain way. So the gauge field does that and the Fermi field does that. Unprimed now, psi is now in my notes, I've only got a function of phi? Here. Huh? Unprimed psi is a function of phi? Only yes. phi? Yes. Yes. Okay. So when we move to the next line, where we're now taking psi prime at phi plus 2 pi, why don't we change 
the unprimed side to phi plus 2 pi as well? Brilliant. I think you're right. Brilliant. So we did. <laughs> yeah, I can be sure. Yeah, that's the way it isn't even in my notes. Go. All right, let's, let's go. Yeah, I left out of the equation. Substitute for lambda phi phi over two. Yeah, phi. There's something. Oh, it's lambda of phi phi over two pi. So that's minus i q, and then lambda of phi plus two pi is phi over two pi phi plus two pi. So now this is multiplication. And that's why, because of periodicity, as you point out. Okay. The next equation I got in my notes was I said, oh, that's just this uh, modulo over 2 pi, psi prime of phi. That's right. And now, oh, why is it a prime now? Yeah, that, that's, that's what I think it's just a regular psi. You know, I think you're right. That would per make perfect sense because the 2 pi here, no, that doesn't, it still doesn't make any sense because, because this, um, this 2 pi cancels the 2 pi, but there's an e to the i q phi here. Maybe that's what I was saying in my notes. All right, hold on. Let me say what's in the notes, okay? And then we can... What's in the notes may in fact be correct. Yeah, all right, this is what I should put. This is what's in the notes. Why is this? Well, the 2 pi cancels and, and it just leaves you with e to the minus i q phi times phi over 2 pi. Right, it's phi times, this is multiplication. Mm -hmm. In fact, I did. And so that just gives you that. In fact, let's put in two steps. That times e to the minus i q phi phi over 2 pi psi of phi. But this is what we call psi prime of phi. So this is e to the minus i q phi psi prime of phi. Okay. So this is in fact completely right. The notes are actually correct. Equivalently, psi prime n of phi is e to the minus i q lambda psi n of phi. substitute for lambda and we get e to the minus i q big phi little phi over 2 pi e to the i n phi assuming orbital angular momentum okay. uh, times some psi zero say some constant and so in other words psi, psi n prime is then e to the i n minus Q big phi over 2 pi phi 
psi is zero. So in other words, if you take, if you have this funny gauge field where a phi is flux over 2 pi, we can blow it to zero by making this gauge transformation. But if we do the Fermi field that started out being just psi n is e to the i n phi psi zero becomes this Fermi field, which has this funny angular momentum. In other words, LZ psi prime n of phi, which is just minus i d phi psi prime n of phi is equal to n minus q big phi over 2 pi times psi prime n. Okay, so it's the same, so it's the same conclusion reached from a third point of view. And now so the gauge transformation actually changes the eigenvalue of the angular Right, value. right. But frankly, I think the way to think about this, the better way to think about it, because I, I don't know what to make of a singular gauge transformation where the gauge function is discontinuous. I like these two approaches. They're simple, they're clear, they're straightforward. I got so screwed up here. Um, obviously, I wouldn't like that. But also, it's got this discontinuous function, which is very common. All right. Suppose, now, now what are, these things are composite structures. So, uh, in other words, it's a, it's a solenoid with a particle going around it of charge Q. Okay. We can think of that as a composite object. And we can now, now that, so far we've been talking about it in three dimensional space, or three plus one dimensions. Now let's, so to speak, project out the third dimension. Let's look at, look down on the solenoid. So this is this particle charge Q going around it, and B field coming out. And then we can imagine another one over here, another solenoid, and another particle charge Q. And we can think of these two things as, as composite objects. Okay. Now we can imagine what happens if we rotate this like that and this one like that. All right. The point is that as you move, which is which? Well, I don't know. Anyway, as you move two around one by pi, what do you get? You get a factor that's e to the i integral 0 to pi a phi d phi with a q here. That's the phase factor. a mu dx mu. Which again comes from that term in the action which is just integral a mu dx mu q. That's the term in the, in the, in the classical action. So that gives you that term. And this is e to the i q pi. That's how much we've gone. And what's a phi? Well, a phi is this big phi over 2 pi. So this is e to the i q big phi over 2. But this is just what happens, the phase this guy gets when he goes around him by pi. But on the other hand, when that happens, effectively, this guy has gone around the other one by pi. So altogether, the phase is e to the i big phi times q. So that's the, um, that's the phase that you get when you interchange the two, in addition to any other phase you might have. And so what is this? Well, if this phase is an integer, I'm sorry, if, if this, if q phi is 2 pi n, then, uh, then you've got the same statistics. In other words, if this thing 
is an electron around a flux tube, then it is presumably a fermion, and you've got two fermions, and you've still got fermion statistics. With two pi? This is the, that's the a boson. Right? Because that's always going to give you one. Nuance, nuance. This is the extra phase. There's also the intrinsic phase. So I don't understand what you're saying. These are two composite things. You're saying when all right, all right. Let, let, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it the simple way. First. We'll check the, the complicated way first. Let's do it the simple way first. Suppose these are both bosons. Suppose it's a it's a Higgs, a charged Higgs going <coughs> on, there, right? Then we sw switch them around. If Q phi is 2 pi n, they're still both. <coughs> but if Q phi is not 2 pi n, but is um, pi 2n plus 1 over 2, I don't know why I did it that way. But anyway, if it's that, then they've turned into fermions. Also, suppose the things weren't Higgses. Suppose they were fermions. Then they stay fermions if Q phi is 2 pi n, but they change into bosons if Q phi is pi times 2n plus 1 over 2. I don't understand that. In other words, this. So if I exchange, if these things are fermions and I exchange them, do I not pick up a phase 2 pi n is what you're saying? What? If, <laughs> if these things are fermions and I exchange them. You're picking, you're, to pick the, 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 Q phi has nothing to do with whether they're bosons or fermions. Q phi depends upon what the flux is. Phi is the flux mm -hmm. in here. And there's the flux here. But, this thing, the thing going around could be a fermion. If the thing is a fermion, then when you want to change them, you're going to get a minus sign. Right, so where's that minus sign? It's still there. It's still there, but you also have this factor. But if this factor is 1, then the composites are still fermions. If this factor is minus 1, then even though the individual things were fermions, they're, they're now because of the flux. Wow. Bosons. That's I think it. it's the. This is because we're talking about the mechanical angular momentum versus a spin. We're not even talking right, about right, the spin. Right, 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 right. I wasn't talking about the spin all along. Yeah. But we assume that we still have the usual connection between spin and statistics. All right, so the point is that whatever the statistics was of these, whether fermionic. Fermionic. <laughs> fermionic or bosonic. All right. When you're done, you could flip according to what Q phi is, but in general, Q phi isn't going to be either 2 pi n or pi 2 n plus 1 over 2. It's going to be some real number. And so when you interchange the two bosons or the two fermions, what you get is an arbitrary phase, not plus or minus 1. And so that's why you call them anions. And I think you might call them fermions. <laughs> because um, then they're neither fermions nor bosons. <laughs> All right, so have we finished? Let me just see. Yeah, we, 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 we finished. We'll check on. So we'll do churn signs next time. And then uh, go into quantum Hall stuff, Hall effect, and quantum Hall, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we should eventually wind up making contact with quantum information theory, about which I don't, I don't know, I, I know, I know almost nothing. But uh, you guys are experts, so, yeah, we, I know all that. so we can, uh, you can rest. All right, you want to start